Anyway, yeah. Um, right, um, good evening. I'm Steve. Um, I'm a local lad, uh, bizarrely, um, born and bred in Lincoln, but had four years out of county. Um, I am a qualified garden designer and uh, soft landscaper. I've been doing that 28 years. I'm now sort of into my dotage. So a few years ago, because of my background in adult education, I started running my own tours and I've been doing these talks for 28 odd years. So I started running these wildlife tours in throughout Britain, um, Scotland, Wales, um, Somerset, Norfolk. So um, that's sort of what I do, but obviously COVID has sort of hashed everything up there. So um, there's some leaflets on the back if you, if you want one. So wildlife and habitats around Lincoln. Um, well, I suppose I'm going to start in city tonight and then I'm going to go outwards uh, from the city. And um, most of the places I would think that I'll show you tonight are within about um, 10, 12 miles maximum of Lincoln, really. So I'm going to start with this, uh, the Magnificent Cathedral, and I have a special link to the cathedral, not because not I was a choir boy or anything daft like that at the cathedral, but um, a few years ago, well I've been doing it for quite a few years, I've been involved with schools, um, sort of advising and creating and giving them sort of some input about um, creating wildlife gardens for the schools. And I used to go in as a volunteer for the RSPB, um, as what was called a bird friendly schools volunteer. So the schools would um, sort of contact the RSPB and say, we'd like to be a bird friendly school. The RSPB would then contact somebody such as myself who was local, who would then go in. The RSPB would supply some feeders, they would supply some nest boxes. So I'd go in, sort of meet the kids that were involved with that section in school. And we would then um, create a wildlife feeding set, the bird feeding station, put the nest boxes up and we'd do the big bird count which just happens to be this weekend. So very apt. But I'd always said to the lady who ran, who ran Bird Friendly Schools Project, Sharon, down at Norwich, I said, I said if the job ever comes up um, at the RSPB, um, just give us a shout, just short term contract. And lo and behold, um, the job came up in 2007 and it was doing what I'm doing now. It was classed as a community talks officer. It was filling in for a lady who, evening, Please take a seat. Um, it was filling in for a lady who was going off on um, maternity leave. And the long and the short of it was, I was meant to do six months, but I ended up doing two, two years-ish. And the reason that my contract got extended is because of this building, really. Purely and simply because of these things, the peregrines on, the, on Lincoln Cathedral. Because I got approached about, um, would there be any, any merit in anything happening around Lincoln? So I said, well, We've had peregrines on the cathedral for a couple of years now. So in 2007, we actually set a project up. Um, we did a few sort of, uh, just did a, a plan on that. And then lo and behold, um, we set this project up for 2008 and the RSPB put some resources in. Um, I was appointed community project officer and it was just sort of down to me and my team of, would you believe we had 64 people came forward as volunteers to help on the project. It was just incredible. So it was just sort of telling the story, it was telling the story about birds of prey and how they were being persecuted. And if you think about, obviously, if you're local to Lincoln, um, you, you realise what we've got up there. We've got a real tourist honey trap. So we've got the cathedral, we've got the castle, loads of people around. And we had, we had about 10,000 people. Um, we were clicking them all the time, come to the project and we engaged with them all. So it was all about telling the story. And as I say, telling stories is one thing, but when you're up against people who have a different mind, um, this, I, mean, I, I had to put this in because I don't believe in doing a story, sorry, doing a talk and just doing it deadpan. I like sort of weave stories in and messages and that. I actually um, saw this in the back of somebody's car and I just felt obliged to do something about it. I don't mean go and pick a fight with the guy, <laughs> but um, I mean, this is absolutely a uh, total poppycock. Um, you know, songbirds have not disappeared because of birds of prey. Songbirds have actually disappeared because of changes in farming practice, overwintering sort of cereals and stuff like that. Um, and I think there's a little bit of a clue as to what angle this sticker is coming from with the racing pigeons bit. So, yeah. um, and the bit at the bottom, RPRA, is the Royal, is the Royal Pigeon Racing Association. Mm -hmm. So a little bit of a, a clue in there. So to me, that is just sort of spreading misinformation really. 
So what I did on this instance, um, I'd seen this in the back of this guy's car, I knew, I knew where he lived because his car was always on his drive. I got a dossier of stuff together and I knocked on his door and I said, some evening reading, some bedtime reading for you. And uh, anyway, <laughs> but it wasn't, I wasn't picking a fight, but I just thought, hang on, I can't let you get away with doing that and, and that, so. But anyway, um, yeah, as truth be, truth be known, um, I was working on the project in Lincoln between 2007 and 2009 and I found it a real problem to sort of balance RSPB work and also running my own um, landscaping business. So I decided to say ta to the RSPB and um, concentrate on my gardening work. And in 2011, I had a, had a telephone call from a young lady who was studying journalism at the University of Lincoln. And uh, she'd wronged somebody else and they'd said, well, give this guy a ring. And um, anyway, I got a phone call from this lady. Uh, she said to me, she said, uh, I'm going to give you this information. She said, I think in the break of pool, I've seen as I walk back off campus, I've seen a dead peregrine floating in the break of pool. So I actually went down there, net, plastic bag, and I fished this bird out, and lo and behold, it was a dead peregrine. It was floating in the Brayford. I sent that away. Uh, I've run the police, by the way. I run, um, I run the local police. This guy on my left here is a guy called Nick Willie, who's the local wildlife crime officer, and uh, contacted the RSPB investigations. And uh, lo and behold, I took this bird home. I tidied it up a bit. I knew, I knew something had sort of gone um, a little bit foul with it. I ended up sending it away to the University of Lancaster to their terrestrial ecology and they retrieved 19 gunshot pellets from this bird oh, and um, they said it would have died instantaneously, it would not have sort of um, been able to fly on a bit and then been sick. So um, I doubt whether that bird was actually shot in the middle of Lincoln because somebody would have seen that but I think it was shot and lo and behold it probably drifted down river. But anyway, Nick rang me up on a Friday and he said, what are you doing on Monday morning at six o'clock, Steve? I said, well, I was hoping to have a bit of a lay in. He, um, he then said to me, he said, would you like to, could you make yourself available to be up at the cathedral? And what you're seeing here, you can see BBC, this was Crime Watch Roadshow. <laughs> so in actual fact, I was on Crime Watch Roadshow myself and Nick and we did a piece to camera. And uh, thankfully I was on the right side of the law. Yes, for the right <laughs> but, reasons. But, but they put out the message and all we got back, we got people sort of ringing and saying, you go back two slides, it'll be the pigeon fanciers. <laughs> so, so just sort of square in the circle. We never got any conclusive proof, but, um, but it did get, you know, it did get sort of a little bit of uh, interest sort of going in it. And it spread the message as well, so. But uh, that was what, this is what we're there for, the, the cathedral. So as I say, the talk tonight is starting in the centre of the city and then we'll sort of go out and around. And um, I was there one Sunday and we'd got the, got the, we'd had the adults flying around and by now all three juveniles were flying around. This was way back in 2008. And we had one male and we had two females. And um, I used to say to people when we were up there, and please do go and you know go and have a look. They were still they are still breeding up there. Probably not the same pair now, but they breed up there most years on the cathedral there. Once the um, chicks get airborne, in, it's usually about about the middle of June. It is just phenomenal to me. I'm not, I'm not a big red arrows fan. I don't know if I should say that, but anyway, I would sooner watch peregrines. Give me peregrines any day of the week rather than the red arrows and. Uh, but they're just, they're incredible. They sort of do, they play TIG where they will sort of fly and touch one another's backs and then fly off. You'll see them land on the, on the weather vanes and the weather vanes obviously spin. So they sort of semi land on them and they spin around on the weather vanes. It's, it is really hilarious. So, um, so that's really peak time is the middle of June really to see them airborne, so. But the adults do stay there all, all year round. So, uh, so that's that. And then I'm just gonna leave the center of town. This isn't, um, it's a place that isn't a million miles away, and um, you'll probably be aware there's been quite a lot in the press about it last, in the last couple of weeks. Um, the City Council have actually passed um, the plans for the Western Growth Corridor. Um, I mean, I live down on Doddington Park, and um, I was particularly interested. I mean, I, I sat through just over five hours of that meeting on the computer, sort of watching it all and watching, listening to them all say their bit and that. But I went in with a very open mind, and I'm still, I think the scheme, yes, we need more housing, but I think there are other ways of doing it, not necessarily somewhere else, but I think there's other ways of doing it, but that's my own 
personal opinion. But one place I love to go birding, which is uh, really very quiet, and this is one of my major concerns with the Western Grove Corridor, it's a place called Bootham Mere. Now, a lot of people don't actually realise it exists. I mean, I'm seeing sort of heads in the audience sort of nodding. But Bootham Mere is a lovely, lovely unspoiled spot. It's managed by a good mate of mine called Graham, who's the manager down at Wisby. And um, they go down there with work parties occasionally. But um, So I was really concerned about how it would be protected, bearing in mind that the Western Grove Corridor is probably going to take about 23 years to completion from when it starts. So um, I am quite satisfied. Um, you know, I'll be pushing daisies up by the time that anything gets anywhere near the, the uh, boot of the mirror. But it's a fabulous spot, it really is. It's um, really peaceful, really quiet. And, um, and that's just one, one shot from there. It's just a really fringe mirror, really. So uh, literally within the city boundaries. So I don't really want to big the place up, so I don't want everybody going down there. But anyway, that's another. Um, but it, 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 uh, it did get some abuse, I must say, during COVID lockdown, because um, kids were going down, when well, I say kids, whoever were going down there on bikes, and there was fires and there was evidence of drug use as well down there so um, it wasn't sort of the most salubrious of places at the wrong times and i've got a good mate called andy sims um, andy sims in lincoln a very keen bird watcher really really knows his stuff sadly uh, andy was making his way down there one morning about three weeks ago and he went over on his anchor, ankle and he broke his fib fibula and his tibia so he's in a massive cast at the moment he's got plates in and that but andy uh, i would say five out of seven days a week he would go down there and watch the whole patch. So Andy was somebody that they went to for local bird records because he put everything on what's called bird track by the British Trust for Ornithology. So Andy was somebody that obviously they went to for, for what he'd seen and certain times of the year and that. So, um, so it is, it's a lovely, lovely spot. And um, I'm trying to think, well, I have to keep looking from the side. And uh, this is nothing to do with Bootham Mere, but Things are happening um, within our cities in general, but things are happening in our cities that people, uh, probably people aren't aware of. Um, if you go uh, not a million miles from where I live, on Doddington Park, there's a road called Sadler Road and it connects Wisby Road through to Doddington Road there. And um, just this winter, um, I'm trying to think, there's a, there's a gymnasium down there that's just no longer functioning. Um, on the roof of there, I've counted over 90 of these coming into roost at night, uh, pied wagtails. And pied wagtails, that, um, if you go onto records of, um, of the British Trust for, Orth for Ornithology, the BTO, um, they refer to them as the Tesco bird. Not that you can get them um, on sort of mail order or anything after the shopping order, but um, they're very much a bird that because our cities are two or three degrees warmer than the, out of, you know, the country outside, um, our cities, they will come into our cities with that extra bit of warmth and because it's warmer there's usually a lot more insects in the winter so this is what they'll be feeding on. So they, they come in and um, they'll sit up on the roofs and that and congregate, you see them coming in at the last light so it's a little um, known um, sort of happening really, pie by tail roofs. So. And then um, we go to uh, Booton Park, um, I really just sort of featured this uh, for a couple of reasons. One. Again, as I mentioned, Booton Park, um, I used to go around um, Hartstone Park quite a bit with my nan and my granddad when I was a kid, but also um, used to go fishing there a lot when I was uh, in my teens and with my mates and that. But Hartstone Park um, and Wisby, which I'll come to in a, in a short while, obviously they, um, particularly during COVID, they got absolutely hammered by people because people could not go very far. So um, there was a lot of pressure on these places. Um, but Hartstone is really, really famous for these things, um, oh, yeah. herons, and they actually nest on the island. There is evidence now that these um, smaller cousins of the herons, about that so high, the little egrets, that are like a white heron, they are actually uh, roosting with the herons, but also, um, they're also, uh, I think there's a couple of pairs breeding on the island now. But uh, herons, um, I think, when again going back to when I worked for the RSPB, we ran a little project for three weekends down at Hartstone and we were trying to sort of engage engage with people and tell them about the ducks, tell them about um, the herons in particular. And uh, the herons are subject to the longest running bird survey in the whole of Britain. I think there's the heron heron sense, census has been going something about 
I think it's something like 88 years now that they've been recorded because herons are faithful to every site so if they sort of look on how many different nests have been the numbers that are being occupied every year they get a good idea of whether they're going up or down because at the end of the day these species um, herons being a predator they're at the top of the food chain so if they start declining there's something happening sort of underneath them so um, but generally I think it's usually about sort of 11 to about 14 nests that are occupied at uh, at Sound every year. And then if we go a little bit further, um, sort of towards Dollington Bay, there's an area called Swan Oak Lakes, and um, still within the city boundary, it's a, a, a real sort of mix of gravel pitch, you'll see one or two of them in a moment. Um, a fairly quiet area, I mean, as I, was, um, as I was growing up all those years ago, again, another spot I used to go fishing, but obviously it's, um, it's really matured since then, you've got a lot of sort of willow scrub around the edge and um, it's uh, linked into sort of Hearts Home Lake there but it's what's known as a triple SI so it's a spot site of special scientific interest and um, that is principally because of the water quality um, the aquatic vegetation that's found in there but also the dragonflies it's, it's really really good for dragonflies so and um, there is um, there is well I haven't heard of rumour a few years ago and I know it's true that there are actually adders there as well, but they keep that sort of fairly quiet because the adders are away from where people sort of walk around with their kids and their dogs. And um, it's not, I'm not going to sort of stand here and lambast uh, dog owners, but uh, or anything daft like that, it's not, it's not for me to do. But um, one of the principal things, whenever you talk to wardens of any, any places such as Wisby, um, wardens at, at, um, at Hearts and Country Park and other areas. Um, dogs can cause a problem. I mean, this probably this daft old um, Labrador here is probably not going to cause um, a lot of problems. But you've got to consider that um, bird, a lot of birds are nesting within two feet of the ground. So um, between about sort of April, when things like willow warblers and that are coming back, right through to August time, there's a lot of birds that will be nesting and there might be sort of um, having double broods and then we'll be fairly close to the ground. So if, if ducks, sorry, ducks, if dogs are going sort of into the undergrowth, it can cause all sorts of problems. And um, so really, you know, it is, it's about self-policing really, but I know it's one of the main things for sort of um, the wardens on a lot of reserves really. And they should really, there's plenty of signs saying dogs on leads, but I just took that as a, a general picture really. So as I said, it's really important for um, dragonflies down at um, um, Swanholm Lakes. And um, this is one of the um, species down there. This is one called a hairy hawker. Um, you really have to look up close, but they do actually have hairs on the main body. They've got tiny little hairs, that's where it gets its name from. Um, there's probably about, um, well it is spreading its range a little bit. There's probably about six sites in the whole of Lincolnshire where you'll find this. and um, and certainly swan home is one of them so quite a big dragonfly probably two and a half inches long so best time to photograph them early in the morning when they're not active in the sun and that so and just sort of general you know just a couple of general views really for swan home because you've got a lot of birds you've got a lot of willow scrub i mean autumn is just tremendous down there and the reflections in the water i had a walk around there um, a couple of weeks ago and um, you know there are loads of sort of things like coots and gadfly and widgeon and all sorts of different species of duck in there and um, I did some work down there with a the local councillor um, last winter because during Covid they have been getting a lot of abuse, they've been um, pits that is, um, there's a lot of people down there doing a lot of drinking and leaving a lot the bottles behind and cans and all sorts, people going down there swimming as well so and two of those pits are actually privately owned, they don't belong to anybody else, they're privately owned by somebody who then lets them out as a, for a syndicate for fishing. So um, there was a lot of um, backlash from the anglers as well, that there were people down there being really rowdy and a lot of the anglers were actually down there sort of fishing all night for carp. So you've got sort of people at two different positions in their, in their interests really. So, so I did some work with the councillors, a couple of other lads sort of got involved and we were we're basically moving things like gorse and we're moving sort of willows and things and planting up areas that were like sandy beaches if you like to deter them so as I say you know it's just a wonderful place people go around there and really enjoy it within the within the city boundary really so whether you live on Hartstone, Swampool, 
um, where I live on, on Donington Park there. It's just, a, it's just literally around the corner from, from all of us there. But it is particularly important for this species down there. And when I was down there a couple of weeks ago, um, I counted uh, 19 of these. They've had counts well over 30. This is a, this is a, it's a, it's a member of the duck family, but ducks are divided into three different groups. You've got what are called the dabbling ducks, so they sort of feed on the surface and feeding on weed. You've got ducks that dive and feed on weed and crustaceans and mollusks. And then you've got the third group, which are these, which are called sawbills, because they feed on, on small fish. And they're called sawbills because they've got serrations down the side of the bill so they can grip onto the fish. This is a bird called a goosander. Now, then, in an ideal world up in the, in the summer, these are breeding on fast flowing streams. Um, They'll be breeding sort of up in the Lake District, they'll be breeding in the Highlands of Scotland and that, but in the winter you can appreciate the weather really closes in, they can't find the food that they want. So they come down to sort of still waters such as gravel pits in the lowlands really. So um, it is really, really important down at Swan, down at Swan Home in the winter. Um, as I say, counts of high 20s, low 30s. And they just, um, they absolutely stand out the males. I mean, they have like a pinky hue to them. As well but the females are quite different because they have a brown head so uh, if you're down there and see something like that they look very flat to the water as well but they can turn up anywhere i've just seen them on the upper with them just down the back here so they can turn up anywhere but just uh, fishing all the time but it is um, quite important down um, in and around sort of swan home for different fungi um, don't pick this one and eat it because it's highly toxic this is fly agaric but um, the city council through Ruth, who's the, she's the ranger down there, Ruth had to go around, um, around Swan Home a few years ago now and uh, put up signs in about eight different languages because there were obviously Poles, there were Czechs, there were Estonians, people, all these people, different people of different nationalities were living locally and um, they were going down and picking the mushrooms uh, of various sort of species. So because they were being picked for the pot, um, they weren't getting a chance to release the spores. So really, they, you know, the, the fungi were in some of the speciality ones down there in danger of sort of disappearing. So uh, it's not just about the birds and all the other sort of bits and bobs. So really, I don't want to say too much about this place. So I want to keep this one to myself. I don't want to make it public. But, um, it was funny. Um, this is uh, south of Lincoln. Um, you really wouldn't know it's there unless you've been told. Um, it's a place called Blackmoor Farm. It's between Auburn and um, Harmston. Um, on that road that connects from Auburn going out to Harmston. It's actually on the Neville Estate. Uh, the Neville Estate is, are the people who own the whole of the Auburn Estate there. And um, I actually found out about this place from when I was doing some bird friendly schools work because a, a lady at Basingham School said, have you been down the bird line yet, Steve? And I thought that's very sort of open-ended, but she described where it was, so I went down and had a look. It's about, it's a 30 acre field and it always sat damp. And you'll see in a minute, it's part of the flood alleviation scheme for Lincoln. And um, what the Nevilles decided to do, because there were grants available, they decided, as you see here, they're creating what's called some scrapes. So they took the topsoil off, so um, this is uh, this is Blackmore Farm, and it's um, it's really it, they wouldn't have been able to put it into agricultural production because it just gets sits too wet, and also it was in the uh, the curtilage of the uh, of the flood alleviation scheme. Um, what you've got here, these the, the poplars, sorry, the pointer didn't work on the screen, but in there in that bank, that's just a river Brant. So the water, you know, when the Brant gets full, it's coming down there. You'll see in a minute what, why this field sort of changes a bit. That's just a bit more of a close-up of the, of the scrapes, but I will say this, this picture was some years ago now. Um, the scrapes have sort of grown over quite a bit with, um, with this soft rush. So the River Brant is just behind there. And I've actually walked the bank of the Brant. I walked um, late one evening and I've actually seen otters down there. So uh, uh, just one, but uh, then I saw some movement on another occasion. So, so the scrapes and um, they got, um, permission to do this and they got the grants because of one particular species which are a bird which I'll show you in a minute but just to show you how that becomes so important because in the winter of 2019 going into 2020 if you remember you can cast your mind back to just before Covid we had an incredibly wet winter yeah. we had loads and loads of rain and then it sort of came to 
February and the rain just stopped and then we went into Covid lockdown and suddenly uh, the gods threw summers at, summer at us just from nowhere. It just went from this uh, biblical sort of rain to sort of biblical sunshine. Uh, this is exactly the same field and this was in December in 2019 and slightly out of shot this way um, obviously still the brant's behind there, out of shot here there's a couple of sluice gates and uh, obviously the brant goes into the Witham, the Witham then comes through Link and it gets down to Jackson's Bridge obviously some can go down into the central drain, some can carry on um, along the upper Witham and up through Lincoln, Brayford, Lower Witham etc but they, they, what they did, they used some of these fields down there and they just hold on to it and gradually let it back into the river as, as they get rid of it so it became a bit of a, a, a sort of wild fowl waterland sort of down there in the winter everything was fairly well spread but there were things like hooper swan there was the odd sort of white fronted goose there was all sorts of things down there so a completely different habitat so this is the bird the lapwing that they actually created the scrapes and that land for because lapwing is a bird that uh, on agricultural land that's just um, it's just disappearing at, at an alarming rate they're like wet grassland they're like sort of um, low sections with tussocks because the chicks can get under the tussocks and uh, um, sort of hide from predators if you've got crows overhead or something like that. And in the early stages on Blackmore Farm, um, there were probably about 15 pairs of lapwing nesting in the first couple of years. There was a couple of pairs of red shank, we even had a pair of avocet nest down there. So various sort of different things nesting down there. Um, and sadly, I think now, it really wants a bit of work on it because I think it really wants re-scraping and more mud exposing again because that seems to be what sort of brings them in so they're still less down there but not in massive numbers and then these um, we get down there and they do breed down on Blackmore Farm this is a bird called a yellow wagtail so you've seen the pine wagtail these um, might be passing through and going other areas but they'll stop off on short wet grassland they love it because of the insects very often sort of associate with cattle as well not so much sheep, but they are like, this is a male, like a, almost like a bright yellow canary. They're just stunning, they really are. And um, you sometimes on passage, you might get flocks of 40, 50, 60 of these, but generally every year down at Blackmoor, okay, they're a little bit small. If you've got a telescope, you see them sort of flitting about. So quite a nice bird to see. Um, but what, one of the things I go down there for to watch, I mean, I've got several other spots now that i found to watch hares because I just absolutely love hares. They're just, uh, I love them as a creature. And um, brown hares, you know, we're very fortunate in Lincolnshire. We've got a good head of brown hair, but um, quite interesting creatures to actually watch, you know, with different sort of habits and not just in the spring when they're boxing and that, but at other times as well. But I was down there on one particular day at Blackmoor Farm and I was sat with another guy and we were just sort of chatting. And um, lo and behold, um, we saw this vehicle. So that's the that's the river Brant Bank. I saw this vehicle and he stopped and to, um, suddenly we realised what was going on. He'd got five or six dogs out the back of his van and um, letting them go on the field and we saw one or two sort of chasing about. So um, that, that photograph I took, that was with a, a long lens and then that picture itself is actually blown up a little bit more. And the guy I was in the, um, in the hive with he rung the estate manager, the estate manager, he knew that there was only one way onto the Brown Bank, so he closed that off. Um, and in actual fact, that picture was then forwarded to the police, and the police prosecuted this, this guy, um, purely simply for trespass, because they had to catch them in the act of hair coursing to actually uh, prosecute them. But, but nonetheless, they got some, they got some informa information on the guy. And he'd actually come all the way from the Midlands to come up and bring six dogs to go hair coursing. So, and um, I'd only seen again in the press just lately that um, the Lincolnshire Police have really, really sort of got in, gone in hard on the, on the hair coursers just this last winter. So it generally is sort of November through to about sort of February time that they uh, engage in these um, activities, really. But um, one or two of the guys down at the hide there. I mean, I. I haven't been down for a while, not been at all this winter, but one or two guys that go down there, they've set up all, all manner of bloody twigs and sticks and this, that and the other, putting feeders out and that. And it's been, honestly, it's become like a photography hide and I just, I want, just want to go down there and I want to watch wildlife. I don't want to go down there and join the photography, but, but some of these guys, they go down there, they get camped in the corner of the hide, shh, shh, 
you know, and, it, and I just think, you know, I've come, down, I've come down here just to sort of enjoy wildlife, not, you know, not to sort of keep quiet, and, and they will not move. They sit in the corner of the eye and they don't move, you know. So if there's not a lot of space there, you just think, you're clicking your fingers, you know, you're thinking, well, but, you know, I'm not, I'm, not being, I'm not being horrible about this, but, you know, people want to sort of go in and out of there. But, uh, but to be fair, it does bring, with some of the sticks and some of the stuff they've put out there, that uh, it does bring some stuff in fairly close. So a male great spotted woodpecker um, on one of the many twigs, sticks, whatever they've put out there. So, But um, it is, you know, I've always found with, um, with wildlife, it is about keeping your eyes and your ears open. And uh, I just want to put this isn't down at Blackmore Farm. This is just, I mean, I just, it's, it's local to my south side of Lincoln. And um, I was walking along the path, uh, I hadn't seen anybody for at least half an hour, walking along this path on one particular day. And I was actually, it was last spring, and I was looking for um, white throats and uh, sedge warblers and that. And I just wanted to photograph them on top of some brambles. And I heard a noise like I've, I've never heard in nature before. I didn't, did not have a clue what it was. And um, so I'm going, going along the path, slightly elevated path, and I just went a little bit, I just went around the corner on the other side of these brambles, I saw what it was, and there were three fox cubs out in the open, and they were sort of jumping and gamboling and playing with one another, and one saw me, and that was it. I scared them for life, I think, but uh, they disappeared back into the brambles, and um, so what I did, I actually laid on the path, I got down in the grass and I sort of laid behind the bank, a slightly elevated path, and then I sort of plucked the grass out top of the bank so I could lay with uh, my camera with me. I thought, well, I'll just wait, I'll give it half an hour, and it took a good half hour before, and only one came out, so it was almost sent out of the sentry, but uh, I saw another one, just saw the head of another one come out, and then this one let out a little noise, and it was almost like, don't come yet, I don't think, I don't think I can trust any, but, it was just an absolute joy to see one of them, you know, a, a much maligned creature, really, but they are out there. So anyway, um, coming to Wispy, I suppose, in many ways, Wispy is the jewel in the crown, but probably not between the hours of nine and four. <laughs> so so that, that's what I always say. I mean, um, it was quite funny, because during, um, during COVID, um, during the first lockdown, um, where I live on Dobbington Park and I enjoy a little bit of cycling, myself and my wife, we go out cycling. There's a back way into Wisby, off Wisby Road, so we'd sort of take our bikes down the side of a field, fasten the bikes up to a tree where there was some old chains and this, that, and the other. So we'd fasten them, no, they won't get nicked and that. And we went in the back way, and I have to say, being in Wisby with nobody else there, during, it was just absolutely stunning. It really was, you know, you were, um, you could hear every bird song, there was no traffic on the bypass. It was just absolutely amazing. And one morning, on um, sort of a little way into COVID, I saw Graham down there, the manager, and um, I said to Graham about, you know, I've been coming a few times, and I've just been keeping a few records. And he said, please, whatever you do, let me have your records. He says, because nobody else is in here. The main gate is closed. And he says, I really need some records for when birds are arriving and how many temperatures of things we've, we've got. So I ended up doing a little bit of survey work during COVID, which was very, uh, useful for the for the reserve really so um it is a massive area it really is um so you've got um, this one here forget um number 13 because i can't point this is a sailing pit i mean it's huge the sailing pit is but it's not part of wispy um now what has happened again it's really sad because of covid that they've put some extra fencing up you can't walk through around the sailing pit anymore um you've got the millennium pit which is this one, this is Station Road here. So you've got Millennium Pit here, I've got me. Yeah, so that's Butler's Pit, that's a fishery. That one you can walk all the way around off Station Road. Um, so there are lots of walks, but no longer are they interconnected. That's the, uh, that's the sad thing down there. So that's sort of like an overview of all the pits in the area. But basically this is Wisby uh, and what you can go to. The only the only thing I would say is that now, um, here's the bypass, you can go under here. Once upon a time you used to be able to go all the way around Teal Lake, which I loved, but now it's closed off here and it's closed off here. So you can go under the bypass, you can just walk down here to a, a viewing screen, which you'll see in a moment, and that's really it. So, so when I was sort of doing the surveying in 2020 during Covid, 
um, was actually going all the way around Teal Lake there and uh, picking out a song of Garden Warbler and, and all sorts of things really for Graham. But uh, you know, nonetheless, um, I mean, I think there's a figure up there, 2007 somewhere, it says um, footfall of about 100,000 people. Graham reckons uh, last year, reckons he had close on sort of 600,000 people there, and not last year, sorry, 2020, when nobody could go anywhere. He says, you know, just, he said he was basically picking up litter and picking up dog poo, that's all he did, you know. I so think that was common, wasn't it? It was, yeah, yeah wherever. Place, so. yeah. But it is, uh, it is quite an amazing place, uh, but as I say, early morning or in the evening, um, the best time to go. Um, if you go on the north side of Grebe Lake and go late May into early June, um, they do fence it off so that it doesn't get desecrated, but they've got a really, really good patch of uh, southern marsh orchid there. Around the reserve you might find bee orchid as well, there's all sort of bee orchids to be seen as well. And um, one of the birds that you're never sort of far away from because you can hear them as well as see them in the spring are these things, uh, black-headed gulls. And um, when you think back about 25 years, they only had about sort of 20 pairs, but they've just they built up and built up and quite, quite funny really because um, I think it was about 2011, they got up to a maximum count of about 1,200 pairs and now it's come back to about, about 790 pairs. So, and they reckon what's happened, they might still be the same birds, but because there's more gravel workings around Lincoln, they've maybe spread out and uh, recolonized other areas. So just keep your eye on that bird, that's called a black-headed gull. That, you have to admit, is slightly brown, not black. So if you're down at Wisby in the spring, keep your eye out for these things. Because these have got a black head, but they're not called black-headed gulls. These are called Mediterranean gulls, and they have gradually spread up from the south of England. This was photographed on the first pit on Thorpe Lake as you're going, walking sort of past the visitor centre there. They have, um, they've never bred at Wisby, but occasionally you would see them mixed in with the black-headed gulls and Graham was sort of fingers crossed, please, I want them to breed here at Wisby. They've never bred, they've never bred in Lincolnshire until two years ago, they bred at um, a secret location. It is a gravel pit, but it's a secret location. So they are now breeding in Lincolnshire. So, uh, but they're really, really dapper they are. You know, they've got a real big hood on them, real sort of, and they're, quite, they're a bit bigger than a black-headed gull as well, but there's every chance you might see them at, at Wisby in the spring. But to me, Wisby is all about the warblers. Um, and going down in the spring, this is um, sort of classic song that I listen for in sort of early April. Um, if the weather's all right, this is a bird called a willow warbler. Quite astonishing, it goes back to Central Africa every, every winter. But um, if you go over the railway bridge and continue, there's a pond on your right, and continue um, straight on that avenue there, you've got these massive sort of hawthorn um, sort of trees on your left. I always call that willow warbler walk, if you can say that after a pint or two, <laughs> because willow warbler walk is where you will generally sort of hear them sort of down there. So, And um, I suppose the jewel in the crown at Wisby, not the jewel in the crown as they once were, um, oh crikey, if you went back tw 10, 12 years of these, this is a, a nightingale. And um, the song of the nightingale, it is just, oh, it is just incredible. Um, now this was very early one morning, I've been for a walk round, I, I was into Wisby, this wasn't during Covid, this is a few years ago now, but um, I was actually on the way back to the car at, uh, at about quarter past six, I'd, I'd sort of done my bit for the morning, I've been round, and this, this bird, uh, so just this side of the railway bridge there, there's an area of uh, oak woodland, and you can see this is the uh, oak tree just coming into leaf, and I heard this bird calling, um, and it started singing, and it just gave it, it was giving it everything, and um, I, I mean, I, must have, I wasn't close with that. I had the camera sort of on a tripod and that, a good distance off. And then I noticed the bird, it started, it was doing this with its wings. As you can see, it's fanning its tail. This is a male. And I showed that photograph to Graham um, later. And he said what would have been happening, there would have been a female very, very close to that bird. And it was actually not only singing, but displaying. So uh, he says, which is a good sign. So if they're displaying, it means that there is a female there. I think last year, and it only had two singing males down there, but there is hope yet that they might come back because they've found a population of about 12, um, 12 singing males that are right on the border of 
Leicestershire and Rutland, and they reckon they might um, they might sort of fan out from there. So, but I did have the most incredible experience last year um, down there. I remember the dates; it was my mum's birthday. Um, it was the fifth of May, and I went to what's called Coot Lake. I went on the north side of Coot Lake, and I could hear from a good distance away there was a nightingale singing. But I had a nightingale and a song thrush in, um, it was like song competition. And it was just, I mean, they were trying to outcompete one another. I mean, I did record it on my phone because it was just, it was just astonishing. I have to say the song thrush won. <laughs> so, um, and um, this was rather a funny one. This was under, under, um, under COVID. I'll never forget this. Um, and it leads me into something with the next picture because, um, I was uh, walking around Teal Lake, it was April the 17th and um, in 2020 we were obviously in lockdown, we've been in lockdown just under a month and I didn't even hear this bird, I was just sort of scanning on the north side of Teal Lake I knew straight away as soon as I saw what this was, it was actually a cuckoo and the north side of Teal Lake, it's not the greatest of pictures because it was a good distance away, it's been blown up a little bit but it never called once and I'm convinced that was fresh in because it wasn't calling um, wasn't trying to attract a mate, I think it was just sort of sitting and occasionally see it come down to the ground so it's picking up bugs and grubs and that. But um, I remember sort of reporting that and I think that was the first cuckoo reported in Lincolnshire in 2020 because nobody else, there have been no other reports whatsoever and I obviously told Graham about that. So um, it was funny really because I'd been start, I'd started making a few notes before Covid and I don't know what made me do it, I was making one or two um, notes about, um, and, and I don't want to get political, but I was making notes down because I could see what was coming along the way, I'm not trying to be a prophet, but about our glorious leader that we've got now, the PM, and I started making these notes. And I came up with the idea that then, I started making, I was making notes about what was going on in Parliament, and then we came to, then we came to Covid, and I was also making my notes about my nature, and I thought, really, to record it in time, I started writing a book then, and I'm still doing it. I'll hopefully be finished sort of this year. But it is sort of the juxtaposition of how nature was so different and how things were different. People's reports about how their interpretation of nature, how it affected places like Wisby, um, when I went to Scotland, how it affected the tourist trade in Scotland. So it's really, and reports really about um, how nature was affected. There's one or two sort of personal things in there as well. It's not, not a lifetime, but it's just a comparison between nature and what was happening in real life. And I just tried to do it with humour and, and that, and sort of try and see the funny side of things in spite of what was happening out there. But uh, anyway, so, so I'm still working on that. So uh, anyway, but it will, just be, it will just be a year. It is just quite, it's quite interesting because the title of the talk is Wildlife Habitats in and Around Lincoln. But habitats are changing all the time and the man sometimes has to intervene and sort of do some management and they've got a great team of volunteers down at Wispy doing work and that. But you know, if you sat down with Graham and spoke to Graham about Wispy, he was the under manager to Phil when he was there. And Graham has seen the place sort of change over the years. And he said, now we don't, we don't, we used to have those, but we don't get them anymore because our habitat has changed. And this is one of those species. This is a bird called a sedge warbler. And they used to have sedge warblers in, in big numbers down at Wispy. Completely, just a, a case they'll get one, but it might not breed there. So, so this was photographed just a little further south of Lincoln, a place I'm bringing to very shortly. But certainly, um, in in terms of sort of birds, I can remember I lived out at um, Spilsby uh, from 1986 to 1990, and I remember going for a walk with some friends around Wispy Lake. And um, I remember seeing these three birds in the sky and looking up at these birds and thinking, if I didn't know better, they're buzzards. Mm. But then I thought to myself, 1987 Lincolnshire, buzzards in Lincolnshire, we don't get buzzards in Lincolnshire. <laughs> Move on 30 years. They reckon in Lincolnshire now, we've probably got somewhere in the region between 250 and 300 pairs of buzzards breeding in Lincolnshire. So. Uh, you know, in a 30 year span, how they have spread from the west to the east. And I mean, they're breathing very close to Wispy and you'll occasionally sort of see them down there, so um, soaring overhead. So um, Wispy sort of, although it's great in the spring, it comes into its own in the winter. Um, these are resident all year round. This is a tufted duck, this is a male. 
female tends to be a, a little bit more sort of, sort of brown um, on her flanks instead of you've got this wonderful colour on the side. And so the tufted ducks are there all year round, but then we do get one or two of these on the pits in the winter. This is a male golden eye. So these might be breeding up in Scandinavia in the summer and then come down for the winter. Absolutely fantastic looking birds these. If you go to Millennium Pit, um, what, just around Christmas, there was probably about 30 of these on there. Uh, both males and females. Again, the females have more of a brown head than this lovely sort of greeny sort of black sort of finish. And you can always pick these out because of um, the males, because that white dot on the cheek there. And at the risk of putting my neck joints out of, out of place, but if you watch these, if you go down now, you will see them do this curious sort of um, courtship dance where the males, if there's a, a female about, you'll see the males and they were literally throwing the heads back and throwing the heads right over their backs. It's sort of just a, a way of sort of trying to attract the female. But certainly, um, as I've always said, and when I, when I sort of run my tours and my trips and, and that for people, um, and when I used to teach, I always used to sort of, it's not about having a bird book and trying to memorise 200 species of bird. I think, well, it's not that, so it must be that. Oh no, it can't be that, because it's that. I always used to teach my bird watching on the habitat. So if you learn the habitat, you tend to get used to what you're probably going to see there. And it's about anticipation as well. And um, down at Wisby, they've got good numbers of these. This is a bird called a bullfinch. This is a male. And um, so in the spring, they'll be feeding on the buds of things like blackthorn, nice and soft, good food for them. But in the winter, they've got to eke out a living. And one of their favorite foods, as you can see here, are dried bramble heads when the seed is sort of withered. And it's, so if you find a good patch of dried bramble, um, you will sort of, uh, you know, you have a good chance of sort of seeing bullfinches. But you can't miss them, you know, I mean, that's the male, the female is a little more washed out. But as they fly away, they have a real white sort of rump patch on their bum, so dead easy to pick out if they're flying. But they have got an incredibly strong bill. Another thing that you might find them on are these things. These are the seeds of ash, they're known as ash keys. And uh, bullfinches have been known to sort of feed on ash keys as well because of the real sort of, um, uh, sort of substance and the strength they've got in the bill there. So. And um, it's sort of a bit of a funny story regarding these at Wisby. Um, it's varied in the last few years. Um, it's a semi-starling murmuration. Um, I went down about three weeks ago, and there's probably about 8,000, and they came in and they did all, the, all their bits and then went into the reed bed. Um, I had um, some friends um, uh, sort of, they were coming to visit some relatives in the area, and they, uh, they came, came across, and we went for, went for a walk with them in the afternoon. I said, oh, I'll go down with me, I'll show you the starling murmuration. Had 36 come in, <laughs> and that was it. What? Get more than that on our roof at home, you know, sort of thing. It was rather embarrassing, I have to say, but um, but generally in November is the time. If you're going to go and watch starling murmurations and starling roofs in November and into December, when they're all sort of coming from sort of, they're coming from Eastern Europe and they're getting together, it's like a, it really is a, um, it's like an information network. They're passing on information to another where the food is and, and you know, locally and that. and. Uh, you know, the sort of um, security in numbers really. So that's um, not the best of pictures, but then at the end of it, um, they do just sort of, they drop into, they drop into the reeds sort of, um, and they'll go in like little waves, they'll sort of find one lot go in, then the next lot will fill the next section of the reed, etc. So quite an interesting watch really, and there's usually a sparrow hawk around having a go as well at them as they're coming in. And just really um, bringing sort of the wispy complex to a, to a, a close really. This is the view if you do walk round um, Glebe Lake, sorry, Glebe, Grebe Lake, and then go just under the bypass and then turn right, there's a viewing screen and this is what you'll see looking down the pit. So um, it's well worth a walk down there because you get all sorts sort of, um, coming in there, you might get teal, you might get golden eye, you'll get cormorants sort of there, all sorts of bits and bobs down there. But um, really just to flag up as a, as a finished sort of um, wispy, um, a friend of mine who I've known for a few years now, she actually volunteered at the cathedral when she was a fairly young girl a few years ago. She was sort of getting into conservation and um, she had various jobs since then. She is now the British Dragonfly Society Publicity Officer um, for England. And um, they had a project down there last year because uh, Wispy has now been recognised by the British Dragonfly Society 
as being one, uh, one of the premier sites, sort of in their top 20 sites. So they had a big event down there last September, um, sort of flagging up about the site and sort of telling everybody about it. And if you go around in April, um, this was, the, uh, this was in, during COVID, during the lockdown, um, saw about three of these and this was mid-April. And this is a large red damsel. Um, and they are the very first damsel fly on the wing in the spring. So if you go down to Wisby, you'll see those. And a couple of others, I mean, they've got different species down at Wisby. That's why it's so important as a site. This is one that's on the wing in late May. This is a full spotted chaser. Um, full spotted because of the spots on the wings. Quite a chunky dragonfly, you can't miss those. And then another one you might see down there. I mean, there are quite a few, but just got put. Um, so you've had one damselfly, then this dragonfly, and then this is another dragonfly. This is one called a black-tailed skinner. And um, so there are three of the species you're likely to see there over a period of time um, through the summer. So um, very, very important wispy. It's not all about people, kids, dogs, and, and a few ducks. You know, it's uh, quite important for something else. But where you've got dragonflies, you will get these. And this is a, this is a bird called a hobby. It's a migratory falcon. Um, they come to us the overwinter in Africa and they arrive about the beginning of May and they actually are feeding on dragonflies, they're incredibly agile birds, so uh, really amazing. We can always identify these with the, uh, with the rump there. And um, I've, got a, I've got a little uh, story to tell behind this because, uh, you know, going around with me looking at the flowers, looking at the butterflies, etc. I thought, blimey, how many times does this happen that you get a grasshopper that's actually on a teasel stem, you can actually get a photograph of it. So I went up close to it and it was actually dead. <laughs> <laughs> and it was on the stem and it was actually dead and in that position. So I don't mind admitting to that. So, uh, and that is, uh, a, a, it's just a common, um, common uh, grasshopper, that one. So nothing spectacular. But, now then, I was at Wisby and this was during lockdown and I thought to myself, now, um, I've got my wife with me and I thought, well, at least I've got a, I've got a witness with me. I'm not going la <laughs> la. I've not been on the COVID drugs or anything like that. Or, uh, something's not happened with me vaccine or something. I said to Graham, I said, uh, I, I just sent him, a, I rung him up and I said, you're not going to believe this, Graham. He says, you're not going to believe this. I said, I've been, I was on Grieve Lake and I said, I've seen a bloody turtle or a terrapin or something getting up on one of the turn rafts. And he says, oh, that'll be so-and-so, and he got a bloody name for it. <laughs> and he, said, he says, oh, I'm pleased we've seen it, we haven't seen it for a couple of years. And of course, if you think about the Ninja Turtles and all that, kids were getting these as pets and they outgrew their, yeah. what they call them, Viver Terrarium or whatever they call them. So people were letting them go in dikes and, and stuff like that. So, <laughs> um, so it actually came up and had a bit of a sunbathe on, in amongst these uh, black-headed gulls. So. But it's actually, you'll find these in the wild in Eastern Europe, they're what's known as a striped terrapin because of the, um, the stripes on the neck there. So. You must have been so, absolutely gobsmacked. Yeah, I, I just stood there and I thought, I ain't seen this. I'm sort, of like, I'm sort of like pinching myself and rubbing the end of my binoculars and thinking, oh, and there's something happening with these binoculars. But, but obviously you can see it's a fairly sunny day, so it's coming up, coming up to a bit of a basket there. So. <laughs> anyway. And um, so just moving, um, sort of just move away from Wisby, uh, and I said everything's within about 10 miles. Um, there is a place um, which I absolutely love. I've just put my name down for this spring to do some volunteering there, to do some sort of meet and greet and public engagement down there. It's a place called RSPB Langford. Anybody heard of it? Yeah, Langford Lowfields. It's, um, it's going to end up as the largest reed bed in the whole of the Midlands. Um, it's a gravel pit complex, but phase one is already completed, phase two is maturing, phase three is maturing, but gradually it will become this huge, great reed bed. And it's just a it's great, great place, it really is. I just love going down there. Um, if you go down in the spring, there's every chance you could probably see and hear nine different species of warblers um, if you go sort of late April, early May. This is a reed warbler um, um, arriving back sort of mid April time there. Also, if you go down there, there's every chance you'll see some of these. These are marsh harriers, so they will just sort of quarter the, um, the reeds and drop in on a bowl or something like that. But probably the bird that, uh, I mean, they're not bad to see. You get hobbies down there as well. But probably the bird that everybody wants to see, and I'm very, I mean, I've seen them numerous times, but 
not in the way that I saw it on this particular day. I'll just show you with the next picture that um, I was aware that there was a commotion behind me. I was stood on an elevated platform called the 360 sort of viewing point. I was aware there was a commotion behind me and it was all the ghouls going absolutely mad. And I swiveled around and looked around and, and there was one of these things and it did an arc from behind me right around in front of me before it dropped into the reed bed and it was a bitten. Oh. And uh, so I was absolutely uh, chuffed to bits and I got this bird bang, 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 bang. It just flew on a steady line and um, just, um, you know, they are, um, they're such a special bird. They really are a bird of uh, reed bed, really cryptically coloured and that. And, uh, you know, we have to be sort of grateful that people like the RSPB are creating these phenomenal reserves for them. And Lincolnshire is um, it's famous for these. We're probably um, on the top five counties in the UK. Get yourselves out there and uh, down some of the quieter lanes. Look for lanes with fairly wide verges between the hedge and the roadside. Um, look for sort of strips at the side of fields where farmers have left an uncultivated strip. River banks and that, but uh, but barn owls, we are really, really um, fortunate to sort of see so many of them in, in Lincolnshire. And um, the th only thing that really, really affects these is in the winter if we get a lot of snow cover because they can't get, can't find the food. So generally, if they don't get a lot of food through the winter, they can exist, but they're not in good breeding conditions. So they won't have many chicks the following year. So um, we're doing all right at the minute. It's fairly mild and uh, etc. And um, also, I mean, I do find sort of rooks, or well, all the corvids, the crows, quite interesting. Just um, if, I know it's a bit of a silly request, but if you've got a rookery near you, just sort of count the nests each spring, see if they're getting any, any big, any more in number or any less really, because again, it's another sort of citizen sort of science survey thing as well, so uh, that you can do. And I'll just take you sort of just to the east of Lincoln now. This is down at Five Mile House, so we've definitely gone, not gone more than 10 miles. Um, it's a view back late one uh, afternoon to the uh, from the east side of the Lincoln Cathedral, the River Witham, obviously I'm stood on the bridge over the river there. And um, I've gone down there and um, nowadays, it's just such a success story that otters have come back there in every county in the whole of Britain. And um, it's just, uh, I find it so sad when, you know, these, um, we're hearing stories now about, with private water companies that they're, you know, they're, the government is actually lessen, lessening the pressure on them, they're allowing them to sort of pump sewage out of the rivers. We've had so many years of cleaning our rivers up and it's just, to me, it's just going bloody backwards. It's, uh, it's just bonkers, really. But um, I'd had a tip off from somebody and I went and did a little bit of field work and that. And this wasn't a million miles away from um, Five Mile House on the Witham. And I'd worked out, because I'd seen where the tracks were and that, I sort of worked out where it was going to be coming into the river. And I got myself on the other bank and, uh, and waited really, and I had to sort of raise the, uh, the ISO on the camera to really get some decent lights. A real late afternoon in the winter, this, this was a huge great dog otter, and he was in the river and he was sort of under and then coming up again. It was just anticipating where he was going to be coming up. So I was just so, so pleased to see an otter sort of fairly close to Lincoln. And then um, I had a mate who used to work right in the middle of town. I think it used to be called Destec in the middle of Lincoln, whether it still is. And he used to work nights and he said we'd always see these in the Sinsel drain outside work. So, uh, <laughs> and they've been seen right in the middle of Lincoln. So uh, anyway. So just sort of finishing off, finishing off on some of the east side of Lincoln there. Chambers Farm Wood, sorry, I clicked again. Chambers Farm Wood is... Um, Close to Ragby, um, sort of beyond Langworth and out towards Ragby, um, there is a, a thing called the Lincolnshire Limewoods Project, and as you can see on the map here, um, Chambers Farm Wood is one part of it, but this is the Lincolnshire Limewoods, um, and they're, they're hoping to sort of eventually join these together, or at least have sort of meadow areas, smaller woodland areas, so that uh, wildlife can freely move from area to area, and. Um, it really is quite a unique habitat. Um, there are pockets in there of ancient woodland, and by ancient woodland, it means um, pre-1600. And um, if you go out there, um, go out there in, um, go out there in sort of mid-July time, uh, they have actually recorded at Chambers Farm Wood 29 different species of butterfly. And the Butterfly Conservation Society usually have a meeting there on the last Sunday in July and they do guided walks, you can go around with somebody who's really in the know and they will show you the different species because they know where they want to be looking, what, 
what plants they're going to be on, etc. And um, obviously with the butterflies, you're not going to see all 29 species on that Sunday, but some of the species are spread over the season a little bit. Some might have a generation in the spring, then maybe have a second generation later in the year. Um, this is one called a gatekeeper. We can tell a gatekeeper from a meadow brown because a gatekeeper has two spots, two white spots on its black spot on its wing there. Um, another one, you might see large skipper, but this is a small skipper. Um, these are quite unusual because they never have their, their wings flat away from the body. The, well, the inner pair of wings are always slightly angled up, so quite easy to realise you're looking at a skipper butterfly. And then another one that um, is really, um, I mean, the, the, these are tiny, they really are, well, say tiny, they're probably an inch and three quarters maximum across the wing. You want to be down there in late May, there's an area called Little Scrubs Meadow, and the, um, they actually manage it purely and simply, Little Scrubs Meadow, for this species. It's one, um, it's one called a marsh fritillary, and they lay their eggs on a plant called Devil's Bit Scavis. So if you go down there, Devil's Bit Scavis is everywhere, so, um, so late May is the time to see them. So uh, stunning little things they really are. So, but uh, it's certainly the place in the county for butterflies. And um, I was sat there eating my sandwiches one day in the picnic area and uh, I was probably as close to this grass lake you see there as that table is, sat on a picnic bench and I thought to myself, I've got to get the camera, just basking in the sun, but there were, the grass, there were, there's another grass lake as well, they were feeding on little lizards that were on the, on the log pile that it was on. And I was thinking to myself, I wonder how many people have sat there eating the sandwiches and not realised that they're less than 10 feet away from a grass lake. You know, it probably sort of chills people, some people to the bone, really. Um, so stuff is out there if you just look. And then just sort of coming back into the city, really, just to sort of round it off, coming in from sort of the east side of town, Chambers Farmwood and all around there. Um, this is the South Common, and it must be five winters ago now. I mean, they, they can turn up anywhere, but there were three of these birds on the South Common for the winter. It's a bird called a short-eared owl, and they are just absolute stunners. Mm -hmm. And they are what are known as diurnal, which means they will fly during the day. So generally, mid-afternoon, early afternoon, mid-afternoon onwards. And um, you really had to feel sorry for these two, and I think there was possibly a third bird as well, because word got out, and you had this posse of guys with these fucking great lens chasing them around the common. It was really not on. So these birds were constantly being <coughs> disturbed but um, I went up there and I went up there um, I just had sort of my little camera with me baby camera and um, anyway uh, went up there just to sort of view them with the binoculars and that and I just I just kept seeing these guys that were just chasing I just thought oh I just can't I'm gonna I'm gonna end up exploding soon because you know to me the birds should come first and I walked a completely different way out the common and I just thought I'd stop and just have a look around and lo and behold there's one in a bloody bush about it's only about sort of 50 feet away from me so I went click and just walked on so it was almost as if to say that the owl was saying to me oh look at them lots at the other end of the common you know just uh, it was just so funny it really was so funny and I just think if you if you quiet and just spend time on your own uh, nature will happen around you really and then just really as a celebration really it's it's changing all the time um in the middle ages these would have been a common bird this is the red kite um there are places throughout britain that have the word glead in their name so at sheffield there's a place called gleedless if you go into nottinghamshire there's a place called gleedthorpe glead is the old english name for kite so it would have meant there would have been lots of kites there they're scavengers they would have been in the streets in the middle ages picking up all sorts of um, carrion and stuff like that. But um, the RSPB, Natural England, they got together, they've been releasing these over a number of years at different sites. They're doing particularly well down in Berkshire. But the nearest place that they've released them to Lincolnshire is a place called Fine Shade Wood in Northamptonshire. And they've now spread out from there. And they are breeding in the south of the county, sort of Belton and sort of that area. Um, I'm hearing reports they are breeding in other parts of the county now, up in the Wolds, out near Woodall Spa. Um, and there's somebody that I know, and there was some breed, somebody, summer breeding on, um, it's a farmer's sort of private land, um, sort of south of Lincoln, probably about 12 miles south of Lincoln, so, and that's where this photograph was taken, but, 
you know, just keep looking to the sky because they are out there, you know, just look for this forked tail as you see here, they're just stunning birds. Um, so that really is a success story. So I'll leave you with a final picture from, uh, from Wisby and um, I think I'm supposed to take any questions. Uh.